Ladies and gentlemen, may I say again, as I said last night, what a huge privilege it is uh, to be back here in Australia and in Sydney in particular, and even more in particular here in New College. And we're really enjoying, my wife and I are enjoying our time here um, in Sydney and interacting with so many of you. And we are glad to carry on the discussion this evening. So in the first lecture in this series last night, we laid out the big picture, taking a look at some of those techno-scientific challenges that we all face at present and will face even more, I think, in the future. In particular, we looked at the opportunities and challenges arising from machines, artificial intelligence, robotics, things like that. We looked a little bit at genetic engineering and we looked somewhat at brain manipulation. And then we laid out three of the big rival metaphysical systems of thought that shape the ways in which we think about these challenges, particularly when it comes to our values and our way of ethical decision-making. And the three worldviews that we looked at were first uh, transhumanism, quote, a liberation movement advocating nothing less than a total emancipation from biology itself, in which technology is seen as merely a stage along the way to achieving the ultimate goal our pure platonic mind. Secondly, we looked at what I've chosen to call middle-of-the-road Western secular humanism, or Morwash, with its pragmatic, utilitarian approach to ethical questions, often without perhaps a very clear idea of where those values come from. And third, we were taking a look at Christian theism, with its God-given basis for the value of all human beings and enthusiasm for a technology that heals but also a suspicion, I think, of techno-science that seeks to become our master. One of the questions we ended up with last night was this. If this third worldview is right and all of humankind are made in the image of God, in which God assigns to each human being an absolute value and in which God delegates care and moral responsibility for the earth to humanity, then none of that makes very much sense, does it, if in reality we are ultimately determined by our genes or by our environment or by our brain mechanisms or perhaps all three in such a way that we cannot be held truly moral responsible for our actions. And come to think of it, this is also a very pertinent question for the Moorwash worldview, as I've called it, the middle of the road Western secular humanism. For most Moorwash proponents would wish to highlight their high ethical standards and the responsibility of humanity to use the new techno-science wisely, but if in the end we're just determined to be the way we are anyway, then what scope is there for choosing in a morally responsible way to make things different? As far as transhumanism is concerned, some transhumanists don't think we have free will. One such is Hank Pellissier, formerly manager of the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies at Oxford, in a 2015 article, Pellissier denied the reality of free will, asking, quote, am I happy about my unfree situation? No, not at all. I would hugely prefer to have free will. And then goes on to proceed to propose in his article that the acquisition of free will might be achieved by human enhancement. Now, of course, if you are convinced, as I am, that we have genuine free will anyway, then at least this is one enhancement that we don't really need to worry about. But it is intriguing, I think, that transhumanist narratives frequently display a strongly deterministic tone. Last night I was quoting from transhumanist Max Moore, who writes that the furtherance of human evolution through advanced biotechnology is not only possible but inevitable, close quote. So now to business then for this evening. Are we slaves to our genes? And does it really matter if people start thinking that their decisions are determined by their genetic endowment or by other forces being exerted upon them? What's at stake here? Well, if we're not truly responsible for our actions, as we were just saying, then how can we really be held to account for them? What happens to the justice system? What happens to the choices that give value to relationships, to our concept of love, to religious choices and values? I think a sense of moral responsibility is one of those glues that helps to keep societies functioning properly. We only have to go back one century to find very strong forms of genetic determinism. Consider this quote from a very well-respected scientist at the time. His name was Madison Grant. He was 
president of the New York Zoological Society, who declared, and I quote, that mistaken regard for what are believed to be divine laws and a sentimental belief in the sanctity of human life tend to prevent both the elimination of defective infants and the sterilization of such adults as are themselves of no value to the community. The laws of nature require the obliteration of the unfit, and human life is valuable only when it is of use to the community or race, close quote. Words spoken by a well-respected scientist of the day, and what I find so really surprising and, and indeed shocking is the fact that as far as one can tell, it didn't arouse any particular comment at the time. Of course, the German Third Reich borrowed its eugenic sterilization legislation from California, where compulsory sterilizations were common during the first half of the 20th century. And as we all know, the most extreme examples of eugenics led to the gas ovens of Auschwitz and Buchenwald. Now, of course, today such attitudes and practices are rightly viewed with horror. Surely the kind of genetic determinism that nurtured eugenics is a thing of the past. I think this evening I really want to say both yes and no to that question. Today's genetic determinism, I would like to suggest, is more of a kind of creeping, insidious, backdoor kind of influence, absorbed perhaps more by a process of cultural osmosis from the media, by the abuse of genetic language in daily speech, and unfortunately also from the inaccurate statements of some academics. As a recent news feature in Nature Reports, quote, an increasing number of studies suggest that biology could exert a significant, can exert a significant influence on political beliefs and behaviors, suggesting that genes could exert a pull on attitudes concerning topics such as abortion, immigration, the death penalty, and pacifism, close quote. John Hibbing, a political scientist at the University of Nebraska Lincoln in USA is quoted as saying in the same article, it is difficult to change someone's mind about political issues because their reactions are rooted in their physiology, close quote. So notice the assumption here of determinism. Genes and physiology and genes and physiology are seen as something different from us and our mind, and they seem to be controlling us so we can't even change our mind. And I think the situation is not helped by the insistence of the media to keep reporting the discovery of a gene for this, that, or the other. We have mean genes, gluttony genes, gangster genes, liberal genes, religious genes. There hasn't even been the whimsical suggestion of a geneticism gene that predisposes some people to think that behavior is caused by genes. Whereas, of course, as we think, or as we all know, a gene is simply a stretch of DNA that encodes a protein or some piece of information and that's it. There is no single gene that encodes any kind of behavior in any living organism, let alone humans. Now, one indication of this iconic profile of DNA language in public cultural discourse is that the phrase, it's in her or his DNA, has come into common usage in all kinds of contexts, some of them, I think, rather odd. As Brad Pitt once commented whilst discussing US gun control, quote, America is a country founded on guns, it's in our DNA, close quote. I will make no comment on that. The cloud computing service provider Oxygen assures us that for Oxygen, security is in our DNA. The security of you and your company's data will always be our priority. And then in commenting on its new TV drama series, the director general of the BBC in Britain was quoted as saying that drama is something that is in the lifeblood of this country and in the DNA of the BBC too. So even the BBC has DNA. So the point I'm making here, of course, is that as the DNA language comes into our daily culture and cultural assumptions, the presumed implications are clear, aren't they? What is in the DNA must be immutable and unchangeable, somewhat missing the point, I think, that our DNA is undergoing a constant process of change and diversification, as we'll be thinking in a moment. I think it's also intriguing to pick up one of the themes from last night as well, to note the ways in which mechanical metaphors now permeate our language. He is hardwired to play the piano. She is programmed to obey her parents. I'm not sure that's always the case, actually, but uh, that has been said. Life is a self-replicating information processing system. All kinds of machine language uh, is beginning to permeate our daily discourse. And in fact, there's quite a large literature on the negative social and personal impacts
that arise from deterministic beliefs. When subjects are primed by texts promoting the idea that free will is an illusion, then they are more likely to cheat in subsequent tests and to engage in antisocial behavior. Possessing a belief in free will in another study, but not several other key social beliefs, predicted better career attitudes and actual job performance amongst workers as assessed by their supervisors. And there are many, many other studies of that kind in the sociolog sociological literature. Now, of course, today, everybody knows that genes and environment interact to generate living organisms such as us. Everyone knows that we are this product of a complex gene-environment interaction. And I think somewhat therein lies a problem. For it is precisely in the use of such dichotomous language that we find a fragmented image of human personhood in which the reified forces of genes and environment tug in different directions, as if the human personality were some battlefield of competing influences. And this dichotomous language is inherited from Francis Galton, Darwin's first cousin, who first introduced the contrasting terms nature and nurture in his book entitled Of Men of Science, Their Nature and Nurture, 1874. As Galton himself pointed out, the phrase nature and nurture is a convenient jingle of words, emphasizing, and I quote, that no carefulness of nurture can overcome the evil tendencies of an intrinsically bad physique, weak brain, or brutal disposition, close quote. Okay, he was a Victorian, so you have to cope with that Victorian language. The point here, though, that was that for Galton, nature was always dominant, and it was really Galton who set the parameters for the discussion right up to the present day. If you want to do your own little um, sociological survey on this, just go to Amazon and put in to the search engine nature plus nurture. And this is the sort of thing that you'll see uh, more than 140 years after Galton. Books with titles such as Nature or Nurture, Nature and Nurture, The Nurture of Nature, Nurture by Nature, Nurture through Nature, The Nurture Nature Debates Bridging the Gap, Nature or Nurture, the Great Brain Debate, and lots of others besides. I actually feel that both publishers and authors are getting to the limit of the various ways in which you combine these words together. But the point is that Galton's jingly phrase is still very powerful in framing this topic, and it will often be, certainly in my country anyway, in the media, cited. The nature-nurture debate will be referred to as an ongoing discussion. So what I want to do this evening is to kind of move the goalposts. I want to reframe this discussion within a framing which I think is more helpful and certainly is more faithful to the science and I think will help us to avoid this rather fragmented personhood type of picture that we have inherited from our past. So let's go for another framework. We're going to focus on how our own development uh, endows us with our particular traits we're going to use this acronym DICEY. Um, it's definitely not as jingly as Francis Galton's. I apologize for that. For it stands for Developmental Integrated Complementary Interactionism. So I want to use these as four pegs on which to hang four really important ideas which help us as we think about human development. And I think this approach is going to help us to avoid that uh, dichotomous language we've just been thinking about. So my apologies uh, to medics and biologists here for the next five minutes. We're just going to do a little brief run-through uh, of some key elements in human development. Let's start with a newly fertilized human egg, a zygote. Now, what is inherited from our parents, of course, is not naked DNA, which by itself could do nothing, but a complex system of DNA, RNA, proteins, and nutrients that together operate to regulate cell growth and division. In fact, the human egg just prior to fertilization contains at least 3,000 different proteins, at least 7,500 different messenger RNA molecules. We needn't get into detail here too much, but also thousands more small non-coding RNA molecules, and these are all involved in regulating gene expression. In other words, it's a very, very complex system indeed. By itself, DNA would be as useless as a piece of software on a CD without any computer to run it on. DNA by itself can't do anything. And right from the beginning, there are two types of environment. The immediate environment of the DNA within the cell, and then the macro environment, which includes the fallopian tube, down which 
this very uh, small little zygote begins to soon travel. Plus, of course, the mother, plus the mother's own broader environment. And so the DNA of this little zygote and the two types of environment are completely integrated from the very moment of fertilization. And a key part of the microenvironment of a gene is other genes. Genes are a bit like people. Their behavior and their actions tend to vary depending on the company they keep. So the genome is operating here as an integrated system. And a rather recent finding is that at least 20% of the genome, that is the DNA in our own bodies, perhaps more, is involved in regulating how genes are expressed, how they're switched on and off. There are only roughly 21,000 protein encoding genes in the genome and around 16,000 RNA genes. But in turn, these are regulated by hundreds of protein transcription factors, we call them. These are the protein factors that switch genes on and off. You've got this vast, complex network of interactions. And in the very early zygote, it's not the DNA which causes development to begin, but rather these protein transcription factors inside the zygote which have been inherited from the mother's egg. And those are the ones that regulate which genes in the DNA are switched on and off, and those are the ones that trigger the whole process of development. So if you like, proteins are the players in the DNA orchestra that cause the genes to play an integrated symphony of life. And you've got causal networks operating in all directions. Well, following implantation, the fetus is now exposed to a whole new array of influences from the macroenvironment coming from the, bloods, uh, the mother's blood circulation via the placenta. And what does that give? Well, oxygen, hormones, glucose, proteins, lipids, alcohol if she's drinking, drugs if she's taking drinks, uh, taking drugs and so forth, all of these become available to that little growing fetus. By the third trimester, that developing child can taste, smell, and hear certain stimuli inside the womb in ways that affect the child's behavior following birth. And there are many interesting papers on that. And then, wow, at birth. We all went through this, didn't we, somehow, and we don't remember. I'm so thankful. But at birth... <laughs> The newborn is now bombarded with a whole new array of sights and smells and touch and language and people and dogs and cats and cars and all these other fascinating environmental phenomena suddenly whoosh, a tsunami of environmental inputs. And what we have to remember is that the infant brain is not a sort of miniature version of the adult brain, but it's a self-organizing system that only self-assembles correctly if the right inputs are available at the right time thinking here just where the brain is going to go to our own sort of adult brains. Our own adult brains can contain something like 10 to the 11 neurons, but in total, twice as many brain cells are generated in the developing fetal brain, with half of these being pruned away during development. So in our adult brains, each neuron receives on average something like 5,000 synaptic connections. Uh, the range is very broad. Uh, it can be much less than that, be much more than that. Some neurons connect up to other neurons by as many as 200,000 synaptic connections. That's wiring connections in the brain. Extraordinary. And since there are about 100 billion neurons in the adult brain, this implies that the brain, our brains, contain a staggering 500 trillion synapses, making the brain between our ears this evening the most complex known organ in the universe, as far as we know, a quite remarkable fact. And it's this synaptic architecture which is constructed during the first years of human postnatal development. If you look at fetal brain cells, they're actually called neuroblasts. They're immature neurons. They haven't become mature yet, and they've still got to get their myelin sheaths. They've still got to get their synaptic connect connections and so forth. And it's the experiences then of the baby early in the early months and years postnatally that helps then to shape that synaptic structure of our brains. So this shows the striking increase in synaptic network density from the newborn right up to two years of age. So the average weight of the, the newborn brain is something like uh, 300 grams, but it triples in weight during the first year of life, up to 900 grams. And that's not due to lots and lots more replication of neurons going on. That's mostly all done by the time the baby is born. It's due to the growth in synaptic connections, the size of these dendrites, axon bundles, myelination, all the stuff that's going on to construct, if you like, the wiring of the brain. And as you probably know, there are certain critical periods at which sensory input is vital for the development of specific brain areas. If a baby is blind from birth, 
Then the visual cortex here at the back of the head doesn't develop normally and permanent visual impairment can occur. Children born with congenital cataracts in both eyes have large permanent deficits in motion processing, the ability to just move around and react uh, mechanically, if you like, uh, with the environment. But if the children develop cataracts from 6 to 12 months, then they have no such deficit because of the window of opportunity. In other words, the brain, particularly at that age, displays considerable plasticity during development, and it is the wider environment that interacts with the growing child to help construct the functioning brain. Now, thankfully, that plasticity is never lost during our lives. Our development carries on all the way through our life, right to the end. Um, and indeed, you probably know that when people, are, let's say, they play the violin and they practice and they become professional, there are areas of their brain that get bigger. The, the synaptic, you can do brain imaging and see the differences that take place when people learn a musical instrument way well. Um, I'm changing your brains as I speak to you this evening. Our brains are dynamic organs where lots and lots of things are going on. And one of the things that's going on is due to epigenetics. What is epigenetics? Well, that refers to all the chemical modifications on the DNA or on the proteins surrounding the DNA which are involved in switching genes on or off. And that's a dynamic process. Uh, if you like, if genetics provides the hardware of inheritance, then epigenetics provides the software. Epigenetic regulation provides this key communication pathway leading from the macro via the micro environments to the genome. So there's a constant two-way interaction going on. Yes, we are changing our environments. The environments are changing us through the avenue of epigenetics. What we had for dinner this evening will affect what genes are being switched on and off as we sit here um, epigenetically. And at the same time, of course, we've got a huge amount of uh, not so much neuronal de replication, but a huge amount of DNA replication going on. We're making thousands of miles of DNA as we sit here. Um, and I think that's really great because we're not even thinking about it, I hope. Okay, so dicey then. So in this brief overview, very brief, we've seen how development of the organism is the key. It's an ongoing process that continues, as I say, until death. All the components of the process are tightly integrated, and there is a continual interaction between all the various components of the genomic system, microenvironments and macroenvironments. And there are many complementary processes which are happening in parallel, subverting the language of linear causal relationships. So the Dicey concept, I would suggest, simply bypasses the whole notions of nature and nurture. There are no two separate reified entities that interact with each other, they don't exist. So the insight of Dicey, the developmental approach, is 100% of the phenotype of any complex organism involves genetics and 100% involves the environment. And by phenotype in biology, we simply mean uh, the way the organ is, the way the organism is uh, in terms of its shape, morphology, behavior, and so forth. Now, thinking about the development of a highly complex system like the human, is a challenging exercise for those not particularly in biology or medicine. So I hope you'll forgive me at this juncture if we look briefly at the development of a slightly less complex system, a black forest chocolate cake. Most of, I know I got this recipe from the web, I'm sure it must be true. So most of the cake is flour, more than 50%. So no flour, no cake. Less than 1% is baking powder, no baking powder, no cake. Around 8% is chocolate powder, no powder, no chocolate cake. No correct oven heat, no cake. So the cake is the product of a highly complex developmental process in which the proportions of the recipe are indeed critical for the eventual outcome. But I think it would be odd and indeed impossible to try and assign proportionality to the original components in the finished product. By that stage, for example, the baking powder no longer exists, and the initial components have been chemically transformed. The cake as a whole has emergent properties which are non-reducible to its initial components. So I hope the next time you take a cake out of the oven, you'll look at it with new respect <laughs> as an emergent phenomena and think and uh, meditate on the philosophy involved in its uh, development. That's just to help us along the way, okay, with the whole process of development. Now, 
What about behavioral genetics? Each human individual picked randomly from anywhere in the world, anywhere from this room or anywhere else in the world, varies between each other in something like 0.5 to 1% of their genome. Their genome is simply the, the sequence in our own um, human bodies. Each cell has 3.2 billion nucleotide uh, letters, DNA letters in that genome. Now, some of that variation involves so-called what we call single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs for short. Those refer to the changes in the single genetic letters in the genome. And they, we vary in those about between about one out of a thousand every, of every uh, genetic letter varies between uh, anybody in this room. Now, much of that genetic variation happily makes no difference at all. It's lying in non-coding regions or non-regulatory regions and so on, but you know, some does make a difference. So the aim of behavioral genetics is to try and find out what kind of difference. And we can only really do that by studying variation within a particular population using twin and adoption studies, and now more recently through genotyping, through whole genome sequencing. You can now sequence the whole human genome for only about $1,000, which is quite remarkable. So I wanted to see briefly how this field tends to keep alive, I think, this idea of a nature-nurture dichotomy, and also, very importantly, its redefinition of the word heritability, and that is a really key point here. So quantitative, excuse me, quantitative behavioral genetics seeks to separate out the influence of the genes, the shared environment, and the non-shared environment on variation in a particular trait. And the meaning of trait in this context refers to anything that varies between individuals and in a given population that can be measured. It might be IQ, it might be personality, it might be the number of hours you spend a week watching television. Yes, that's been measured by behavioral genetics, genesis. Uh, it might be religiosity, whatever. Okay, anything can be potentially a trait if you can measure differences. So the shared environment comprises events that make children raised in the same family more similar to each other and less similar to those who do not share it. Examples would be uh, the socioeconomic status of the parents, their parenting style, some parents are disciplinarians and others are not, perhaps the nutrition varies, and so forth and so on. So the non-shared effects describe those influences that are unique to an individual in that family or which have differential effects on them, which might be smoking or drug taking, perhaps some traumatic event happened in their lives, some psychological trauma, something like that. Something which makes those individuals less similar to each other. So what a heritability study does is to calculate the proportion of the total inter-individual variance amongst identical twins or non-identical twins, or you can also use adopted kids as well, that's associated with either genes or these two types of environment. So what this is about, this is where you get a little bit into maths here, but it's about proportions of variance, and those three proportions of variance, by definition, have to add up to one. So the heritability is defined as a proportion of the variance in a trait in a specified population that can be ascribed to genetic variation. And so you can write heritability as a percentage, which I'm afraid is often misinterpreted as if it referred to the proportion of the inheritance of a trait, when all it really represents is the percentage of the total variance in a particular population. And that's the key thing to get hold of. Now, we could obviously spend a long time in behavioral genetics, which we won't, but I just want to point out, along with plenty of complications involved in the technique and so forth, I just want to make a couple of really general points that I think are important for our discussion this evening. First word, as I, the first point I want to make is that the word heritability has gained an extra meaning during the last few decades. In addition to being used as a synonym for inheritance, it now also has its newer technical meaning as used in population genetics as this proportion of variance, which is actually something quite different. So when we say that the heritability of IQ variance is 50%, which it roughly is, the unfortunate impression is often given that a particular trait in a particular individual is actually caused 50% by their genes and 50% by their environment, and that's not what heritability is about. Okay, so that's a negative comment. And just to, maybe if that's a little bit um, strange, um, let's illustrate that point by 
uh, looking at an imaginary population. Let's say that your population under study was 1,000, 1,000 people with very good eyesight. So the heritability of sightedness in that population would be zero in that population, okay? Because there is no variation with respect to that trait in that population. But if I now introduce one blind person into that population, now numbering 1,001, then there is a positive heritability. And that obviously doesn't make sense if heritability equals inheritance, but it doesn't. It's a population statistic referring to a proportion of variance, and so it doesn't tell us anything about a particular individual and the possible influence of genetics on their particular choices. The second point to notice about heritability is that its very method of calculation, I think, perpetuates dichotomous linguistic distinctions such as nature and nurture. Because once mathematical values are assigned to three different proportions of variance that taken together are said to add up to one, then I think it's going to be inevitable, inevitable that those proportions will come to be seen as sort of reified entities that in some sense interact or compete in generating something. And reality correlations between variance and a population cannot play that kind of role. But the perception generated in the reports of heritability values is often along such lines. So that's just to give you a flavor of uh, quantitative behavioral genetics, which is a huge field. And so that's very much a flavor. And obviously, we could nuance the discussion much more than that. But along with quantitative behavioral genetics comes this vast field of molecular behavioral genetics. So what are the molecules? What are the actual genetic variants that are influencing differential behavior in a population? Well, the experimental approach that's um, been used most widely to study that over this past decade is known as genome-wide association studies. And this approach capitalizes on the millions of what we call these SNPs, these single nucleotide polymorphisms. Remember, those are just single changes in the DNA letter in, uh, in the genome somewhere. And these sort of act um, like signposts scattered across the genome. And it's now routine to genotype people for their profile of SNPs. Everybody has a different set of SNPs. We're all different in that respect. Okay. So the SNPs act, if you like, as flags to mark different segments of the genome, different segments of the DNA, which vary slightly between individuals. If a particular SNP keeps on associating with a particular trait at levels above chance, then the inference is made that there should be a variant allele, a variant gene somewhere nearby, perhaps either in a protein coding gene or regulatory gene, that will actually be the target, that will be the gene of interest in talking about this particular variation. I sometimes sort of imagine it a bit like a golf course, if you like. Um, if you happen to be a golf player, a golf player this might help, um, might not for others. But So you have flags around your golf course, and they mark the holes. So the SNPs are the flags, okay, in round, scattered around your genome. The genome is a golf course, and when you found the flag, the hole is going to be pretty close. Okay, so something like that, anyway, if that helps. Now, the GWAS approach has led to some really important discoveries in the domain of medical genetics. But I don't think really it's lived up to initial expectations in the case of behavioral genetics in particular. So what GWAS has been used for in that context is to look at things like intelligence, educational attainment, uh, levels of aggression. I mean, loads and loads and loads of things have been looked at in that way. And that's involving cohorts of hundreds of thousands of people. It's now possible to genotype hundreds of thousands of people and to then look for the contribution of different genetic variants um, to the variation that you see in a population with respect to IQ or educational attainment or whatever it might be. And the story is pretty much the same. For any complex behavior or complex aspect of human person, like personality differences, there are thousands of genetic variants which contribute to the variation that you see in a population with respect to that particular uh, trait that's being measured. And in all cases, let's say, in all cases of IQ, um, each variant contributes generally much less than 0.1% of the variance in that population. In fact, a recent meta-analysis was published in Nature. That means getting together lots and lots of publications on that topic and then reviewing the whole lot together. And basically, what they discovered is that the um, 
genetic variants that they have identified so far in all these different papers explain only 4.8% of the total variation in a population with respect to differences in intelligence. Now, I guess that those findings are not at all surprising, are they, when we think about DICE, when we think about the thousands of genes that are involved in helping to build brains, doing human development. Uh, and so clearly, if there are genetic contributions to levels of for certain types of intelligence, at least, which I think personally there are, I think the, you know, the evidence is pretty clear, but you know, there are thousands of them, there are thousands of them. Um, and so the expectation of 20, 30 years ago that you could find these key genes that somehow would control intelligence and you could change people like the transhumanist thinks, um, then I'm afraid that's not where we're going at the moment. So I think the, um, the transhumanist hope of making superhumans through meddling around with the, uh, the genes that are involved in brain development, I think is a little bit, um, a little bit lacking in hope there. And as we were saying only last night, the complexity of the genome turns out to be its own best defense against meddlers. It is really, really complex. Now, we're going to be looking at the whole question of healing and enhancement uh, in greater detail tomorrow night. But I think it should already be clear, simply by this reflection, that, as I say, the hope to greatly enhance intelligence in humans by messing around with genetic engineering of a few genes is simply, uh, as I say, not realistic because you'd have to change thousands of different uh, genes um, and even then you wouldn't be sure that you would have the individual that you want with greater intelligence because of course all the genes as we've been seeing are integrated in development with these various environments. Now before we dive into a discussion on free will and determinism, I think it's worth noting here that family studies often still remain the most informative in genetic studies of human behavior. Back in 1993, a geneticist in Holland called Hans Brunner described a family of 14 males spread over four generations of a Dutch family who were characterized by mild intellectual disability together with outbursts of anger and aggression, including arson, rape and exhibitionism. Each male totally lacked an enzyme called monoamine oxidase A. Uh, that's due to a mutation in the gene encoding that enzyme. This is an enzyme that plays an important role in neurotransmitter metabolism in the brain. This is an X-linked gene, so the females are carriers of the mutation but are normal because only one of their two X chromosomes carry the mutant gene whereas the males all have a 50-50 chance of inheriting the mutant gene because they only have, we, only, we males only have one X chromosome. So the inference then is that without a functioning monoamine oxidase A gene, the brain doesn't develop normally, and that the present and past absence of the enzyme plays a causal role in explaining the violent behavior. And the condition is now known as Brunner syndrome. Now, for years, this was the only family in the world known to carry this mutation, but then in 2014, a French family was also described with a similar mutation, a similar type of pattern and inheritance, and then there was a similar family here in Australia uh, published in 2015. And, in fact, these new cases uh, of, of the syndrome in France and also in Australia have revealed phenotypes more similar to a subset of those on the autism spectrum who have great difficulty in coping with stressful events. So, what do variant genes do? We've already said they don't encode any behaviors, they don't encode medical conditions, but I would like to call them different difference makers. They are difference makers in both those situations. And the difference they make varies hugely from those devastating behavioral changes we've just seen in this Dutch family to tiny little risk factors. So how then should we define genetic determinism? I managed to escape so far from even trying to define this, what we're talking about this evening. I'm going to define determinism in a different way from the philosophers, but which is more convenient for biologists. And I'm a biologist, okay, I'm not a philosopher, right. So hard determinism, I think we can define as the belief Quote, that given our particular genomes, our lives are not really up to us and are constrained to follow one particular future. Whereas soft determinism states 
that, given our particular genomes, our lives are more likely to follow one particular future, which arguably is not really determinism at all. Now, in reality, the various human states of being are located somewhere on a spectrum, lying between the two poles provided by these two definitions. The more deterministic pole of the spectrum is exemplified by medical genetics, where there are often genetic conditions that constrain one to a particular future. But I think for the vast majority of the population, genetic variants may predispose people to do certain things, but in a probabilistic rather than a deterministic way. Tall individuals are more likely to choose to play basketball, although there are plenty of short people who choose to play as well. These two guys are on the same basketball team in the States, by the way, both, both professionals. The decision to go to university will, of course, be influenced by one's academic record, and that certainly has something to do with genetic variation. Such examples, I think, all come under the heading of soft determinism, but, as I say, perhaps it's more accurate to say that different genomes tend to correlate with different life outcomes in a probabilistic kind of way. But what would happen if there was a single gene associated with, let's say, a 13-fold higher risk of being a criminal? Could we then talk about a gene causing criminality, for example? Well, as it happens, that 13-fold risk gene exists, and it's called SRI. So, out of 131 countries worldwide, an average of 93% of the prisoners are male. And the gene that identifies this population is the SRI gene, found on the Y chromosome. So universal is the higher relative risk of criminality if you have a SRI gene, I think we can safely say that no other genetic variation yet to be found will increase the risk by that much, especially in the worldwide population. And yet, we still hold nearly all males responsible for their criminal actions, and we put them in jail as soon as they're convicted. Furthermore, we note that most people, happily, who possess a Y chromosome, go through life without committing a crime. So, the SRI gene doesn't cause criminality, although clearly we can't go to the opposite extreme and say that it has nothing to do with, with human behavior at all. So, we can't avoid here the challenging concept of free will. And as we launch into a brief discussion about free will, this very big topic, um, can I say here um, at the outset that I'm not talking this evening about the theology of free will. There is a great big theological discussion for those not in the know that goes on and it's been going on for many centuries about how God can choose people um, and at the same time they can choose to follow God and so forth. I'm not Speaking about that, I leave that to the theologians. Okay, I'm not a theologian. Fine, good. So, okay, so um, my approach as a biologist is going to be a little bit different again from that of the philosophers, although obviously I've learned a huge amount from philosophy on this topic. So let me just provide a brief summary of one approach to this question which provides a framework within which we can begin to see how genetic variation influences the choices that we make. I think we have to start with the idea of free will as a lived experience. I think, I hope, we had some choice about what we ate for dinner this evening or for lunch today. Maybe the choice was limited, but we chose what to eat and what not to eat. We didn't say, I guess, that our neurons made us eat this food rather than another food. We all have the experience of human agency. We all have this experience that our choices are in some way up to us. And it turns out that this experience of feeling that our choices are up to us is universal in all human populations that have been studied so far. So, arguably, the experience of free will goes along with language, religion, other characteristics that are typical of the whole of humanity. So, first of all, I would see from a biological perspective free will as a Darwinian trait that emerges during human development along with language, the capacity for moral reasoning, and a basic understanding of the physical properties of the world. People have free will the same way that mostly, most of the time, they have two arms and two legs. And so we can define free will as, quote, the ability to intentionally choose between courses of action in ways that make us responsible for what we do, close quote. Now, we note there the key word intentionality. 
And I suppose the issue really that faces us here is whether our experience of free will is an illusory uh, feeling that we have, an illusion supported by the biological data in general and by genetics in particular. And tonight, of course, we're going to focus particularly on the question of genetics. And I think, like determinism, our experience of free will is on a spectrum. Free will isn't some all-or-nothing phenomenon. We can experience it and indeed have it, I think, at two varying degrees. And so on the left of your screen, we have that feeling uh, at one end of the spectrum of being wonderfully free, perhaps on a holiday, on a glorious early spring day in Sydney, like today. Um, the great range, probably the, uh, the, the, the range in the middle, is probably the reality for most of us, where we have circumstances, duties, expectations, family history, and all kinds of other things that certainly keep us in that sort of middle range, if you like. And then right up the right hand of the screen, we have med medical genetics and these rather rare but very sad pathological um, uh, situations where um, there is severe medical pathology which causes rather striking differences in behavior. Now, there are good empirical data supporting the idea that our brains function on two levels. System one is automatic and unconscious and often plagued by making mistakes as well, whereas system two, as it's called, is deliberate, it's slow, and it's conscious. So it's system two which is most relevant to our definition of free will. Free will is exercised by persons who take into account their beliefs, desires, and emotions, and from these choose which course of action to follow. Differential genetic variation might enter into the process of making different choices by affecting, influencing belief, desire, and emotion, but it is we, the agent, who allow beliefs, desires, and emotions to become effective for action when we choose to follow one course of action over another. I may want to eat the cake, and I also have a strong desire to diet, but it is I who chooses which desire will translate into action. Free will, then, again, we have a spectrum. It's on this spectrum ranging from optimal choice mode to minimal choice mode. But wherever the choice might be on the spectrum, it is the human mind that provides the primary relevant data. Now, obviously, we don't yet understand consciousness. But for sure, I hope we know that we have it when we're awake. So the idea here is that the top-level executive neuronal networks which we experience as consciousness, mind, free will, and the like, exert organizational constraints on the lower-level neuronal networks in such a way that they coordinate the very actions that we desire. It is persons that make decisions, not brains. Professor Ismail from the University of Arizona helpfully reflects on what we actually mean by the I that emerges from the complex human neuronal system. Ismail likens the I of personhood, and I quote, to a collectivization of epistemic and practical effort among components, using the analogy of a jury, which may contain different opinions, but which in the end offers a single voice to the court. The I is then the activity that collectivizes deliberations to speak with a single voice not as a sort of homunculus in the head, but as a language-dependent organizing system that allows the integration of the information from many subsystems to be built into a single representation. The human, the human mind, writes Ismail, has a collective voice in this sense. It not only integrates sensory information, it explicitly self-ascribes uh, self intentional states. So how then should we view the causal nature of particular genetic variants in a system? Well, I think we can, as I say, view them as difference makers with effects on the molecular machinery of the brain that occur largely during early development that then have some influence on the emergent properties of mind. So what about the Dutch family I just mentioned in which there's a complete uh, defi deficiency of this particular enzyme which highly correlates with increased aggression and antisocial behavior in males in the family over four generations. Does the mutant gene, in this case, cause the aggression? I think based on the available data that we have so far, the answer seems to be yes. Of course, there's a very long developmental pathway, a very long causal pathway within the dicey frame between the mutant gene and the aggressive trait. And equally, there might be influential environmental factors at work about which we know little, 
but it does seem to be in this case that the mutant gene as the key difference maker lies at the top, as it were, of the causal chain. But these kinds of clearly defined single gene defects that exert major behavioral changes are extremely rare. As we've seen, once we come to the normal or physiological, normal non-pathological range of human behaviors, that hundreds or thousands of genetic variants, each one of tiny effect, contribute during development to the ultimate differences that can be attributed to genetic variation. So there can be no suggestion here that gene X causes trait Y, nor that gene X is the gene for trait Y as previously emphasized. So what causes then behavioral trait Y? The only answer can be multiple factors, including the person's individual genome, developmental history, family environment, the set of their own personal decisions, life events, and so forth. There is no escaping multi-causality in this context, with each cause, at least in principle, making a difference, even though in practice, disentangling the causal factors is virtually impossible at the level of the individual. Multi-causality leads to true causal democracy, as is often said. So again, back to this idea of a sliding scale, that one end genetic variation exerts a strong influence as a difference maker, which becomes weaker as you go along, and then it disappears altogether at the other end. And then in the middle, we have a huge range of human traits and behaviors ranging from differences in personality to intelligence to aggression and so forth that display, all of them, positive heritabilities. In other words, genetic variation seems to have at least something to do with the variation in those traits. I think here we need to distinguish carefully between traits that happen to us with traits that we make happen, thereby perhaps becoming habits in the process, but nevertheless, we chose them to be so. Well, traits that happen to us include items such as personality traits. As childhood development proceeds during the early years of life, very clear differences in personality traits emerge, as every parent knows, not out of the child's choice, but as a, con as a consequence of developmental biology, of dicey. And these traits are not static. They can be modified to a greater or less extent in adulthood, but certainly they were not chosen by us in childhood. And neither are such traits genetically determined, given, given the fact that variant genes represent but one set of factors amongst many during the developmental process. Other behavioral traits that vary in healthy human populations, such as playing basketball, committing crimes, ethical decisions, choosing a religious belief, whatever, I think we can safely ascribe to free will. These are things we choose to do. They don't happen to us. But genetic variants can still be different makers in that they can lead to the development of people with perhaps predispositions to choose in certain kinds of way. So what is clear, I think, from these reflections is that there is nothing in genetics that falsifies the reality of free will. Even though variant genes can, on occasion, subvert the eye upon whom free will depends, especially, as I say, in cases of severe medical pathologies. Fortunately, however, in the vast majority of cases, uh, human development proceeds normally and we end up with this massive neuronal computing capacity that enables free will to become an ontological reality and provide us with our own particular human identities. It is having the informational resources of our particular human genome that acts as a guarantee that we will end up having this particular type of neuronal system in this particular type of body and this particular type of environment which, taken together, acts as a guarantee that we are going to have genuine free will and therefore have real moral responsibility for our decisions. Now, last night we were looking at three critical entailments that follow from the Judeo-Christian understanding of humanity as being made in the image of God. First, the high value placed on the physicality of being human. We're thinking about humanity as the embodied self there. Secondly, we were thinking about being made in the image of God guarantees the value and status of each human individual, irrespective of their physical status. And the third entailment we were thinking about is personal human moral responsibility. Well, tonight we've been thinking mainly about that third entailment. We can't get off the hook by blaming our behavior on our genes or on the environment. We, humanity, really are responsible for caring for the planet for caring for each other and for the direction of our own lives. And is this more than anything, I think, that clearly distinguishes us from machines, however human they may be made to look? 
But the second entailment is really vital also, the value and status of each human individual, irrespective of their physical status. As we were saying last night, those whose genetic endowment entails that they suffer some handicap in life, be it physical or mental or both, are as much sharers of the image of God as anyone else. Where the individual is unable to express or fully practice their image of God functionality, then human solidarity insists that we care for and protect those less fortunate than ourselves. The care receiver is as much reflecting their status as being made in the image of God as the care giver. The fact of humankind being made in God's image subverts any move to make distinctions between people based on their genetic endowment. When human personhood is viewed in a purely utilitarian way without any grounding in a wider worldview that undergirds human value and equality, then it is remarkable how quickly people can be treated as disposable or arranged into hierarchies in which one cohort is judged to be more valuable than another. What happens to the applications of genetics when the idea of humankind being made in God's image is lost or distorted? Well, here's an example. Based on a purely utilitarian moral philosophy, a paper which appeared in 2012 in the Journal of Medical Ethics entitled Afterbirth Abortion, Why Should the Baby Live? In this paper, the authors, expanding on the views of other philosophers such as Peter Singer, argue that infanticide is morally justifiable for any trait, including especially genetic traits that might equally justify abortion. As the authors point out, some genetic abnormalities are not hereditary, but occur in the gametes of healthy parents, rendering prenatal diagnosis unlikely, so why not carry out the so-called abortion, postnatal abortion, meaning infanticide, after birth, once the condition is apparent. Since the handicapped newborn is not yet a person because it has not yet formulated aims in life, then killing it is justified in their view. And I think in making their rather chilling proposal, it's not clear whether the authors are aware it was precisely the then radically new notion of humankind having absolute rather than relative value because made in the image of God that led to the Christian-inspired legislation that outlawed infanticide that was commonly practiced in early years in ancient Greek and, human so and Roman societies. It's also, and with this I will close, a fourth entailment of humankind being made in the image of God that we haven't mentioned yet, which I think is important in the context of genetics. Our human genetic diversity ensures that every person who has ever lived on this planet or who will ever live is unique. The immense genetic and epigenetic capacities of the human genome make this certain. Identical twins are not really identical from an epigenetic perspective. And it is diversity that we note as soon as we read the original passage in Genesis 1 introducing the idea of humankind made in the image of God, male and female, he created them. The theologian Karl Barth claimed that this was the definitive explanation given by the text itself of the image of God. In Barth's view, God's image in man is the reciprocal relationship of human being with human being. The image describes this I-thou relationship between person and person and between the person and God. Now, I think there's a consensus that Barth somewhat overstated the case, but I think there's an important truth here. The image is not a static status quo, a list of fixed human characteristics, but a dynamic, ongoing developmental process carried out in relationship, maybe less like a mirror, more like a prism in which God delegates responsibilities through the human social community in which male and female equally collaborate. In John's Gospel, chapters 14 to 17, this, these chapters spell out further this whole idea by expressing the relational character of God's being as Father and Son, leading to a theology of imaging and corresponding. As the Father loves the Son, and the Son loves the Father, so the Son loves his disciples, so the disciples should love each other, and so they are called to express that love to the world in community. As Clive Marsh comments, in the same way that God is Trinity and thus embodies relationality within God's own self, so therefore what it means to reflect God must itself be seen relationally. Being made in the image of God refers to humanity in community, not to humans as atomized individuals. And this theological framework coheres well, I would suggest, with the biological story that Dicey provides, a story that focuses on the development of diversity, and that guarantees the uniqueness of every human being 
as I say, who has ever lived or whoever will live on this planet. It's not that cloned humans couldn't have fruitful relationships with each other, but either relationships would certainly be challenging, most likely impossible in a large clone population. In reality, the genetic diversity that exists between individuals is far greater than we had imagined even a few years ago. But far from being seen as a threat, my suggestion is that within the matrix guaranteeing human value and dignity that the imago dei, the idea of the image of God provides, we're then free to celebrate this diversity and the immense variation in an expression of personhood in community to which it contributes. So the question then is, for lecture three, how far should we allow that diversity to keep on existing? A question, by the way, I was asked to respond to in an ABC radio interview this morning. So in our third final lecture tomorrow night, we're going to be thinking about how far we should go in shaping the human future by genetic and mechanical means. And how do we distinguish between healing and enhancement? How much of God's future kingdom is intended to happen right now on planet Earth? And how much do we just have to wait for? And those are just some of our questions that we'll be thinking about tomorrow night. So thank you very much for listening.